Hey there everybody, it's Nathan Cool with NathanCoolPhoto.com and in this video I want to give a quick comparison to three of the more common lights that are used in real estate photography today. So what I've done is I've got up here an Explore 600, I've got an Evolve 200, 8200, and also I've got a speed light. Now full disclosure, I don't work for uh, Autorama, Flashpoint, or B&H, so I'm completely brand agnostic. This just happens to be one of the more common three and they're all from the Flashpoint R2 trigger line because that's just something that a lot of people have kind of uh, leaned toward. Now Yang Nuo used to be real popular. You know from my interiors book that's what I was recommending for the uh, speed light uh, which you can still use and Yang Nuo also has its triggers but with the battery powered self-contained mono lights coming out just Flashpoint Godox they've really been doing a good job with that so even even I've done and you've seen in the book and throughout my other videos I've got the Explorer 600 that I use and I use dumb triggers with that and there's also videos online here that I show how to use those triggers as well as the R2 Pro which I'm going to use in this particular test to show you the results but this is uh, once again probably the most common to where should I be buying and the question comes to me quite often do I, I don't have enough power I don't think I'm lighting a room like this very well so should I be getting an Explore 600 should I invest in the Evolve 200 should I just get more speed lights I've got a streak light 360 should I get that the streak light 360 is starting to get outdated a little bit because it just doesn't have the same portability it's got that separate uh, power pack so that's why for this video I'm going to concentrate on these particular three lights show how they compare where it really matters for real estate photography and I'll dive into a little bit more about them in future videos as well you won't need any of my books on real estate photography for this video but by the way if you are interested there's a link in the description for this video without further ado though let's take a look at some of the results what did I do to set up this test to see how powerful any of these were well there's always one Watt seconds, you know, you can take a look at this as 600, 200, who knows, because it's a speed light and you have to go by guide numbers, and all of them have guide numbers. And of course, you could do some mathy stuff and try to figure that out, but where the rubber really meets the road in real estate photography is how well does it perform. So, the best way to do that is with a light meter. So, I just use a light meter, it's what I use for all my product photography and for all of my portrait photography. Real estate photography, I don't use it, but running a scientific type of test and analysis here, I did use it. And what I did was in this kitchen, you've seen this in other videos that I've done is that I placed it um, on the island and then I also took it and it's off frame here but it was over into the kitchen a little bit farther on a counter over there so probably about maybe six feet away here and 12 feet away there and I was able to gauge how much light then was shed by doing the more familiar type of lighting technique which is the ceiling bounce I've got a white ceiling these are a little bit farther from the ceiling than normal but I did that just to show in this particular video just so I could get everything in frame so they were probably about 18 inches away from the ceiling when I did this. So all the settings that I ran on this were done at the ISO 320. You know, that's uh, one of my sweet spots that I like because you don't have to really stress the lights too much because of that, but you still get a fairly good quality. Now, you know that I also use, by the way, I'm a hundredth of a second uh, for the shutter speed, and that helps to eliminate a lot of the ambient light. So I'm really just relying on the flash uh, to show up. So that's kind of a good sweet spot to do this type of a test. And then measuring then where I would want to be I like to be around as you know f6.3 f7.1 rarely do I go to f8 as you know from the books uh, that I talk about the depth of field you're just wasting it you're not gonna see it when you're that far away from even the island or just a uh, five feet away everything's going to infinity you can focus on anything and it's gonna be infinity focus almost at those levels so anyways though where do we measure and how does that then relate to what we might use on site so let's take a look at all the numbers okay so first off, when I measured over on the counter, once again, this is ISO 320, one one hundredth of a second, using one eighth power on the Explorer did measure, it was very low at uh, F4 when it was over on the counter, nothing could be registered off the 8200 or speed light. When I go up to a quarter power, that's when the Explorer 600 is uh, almost at F5.6, it's at uh, F4.0 plus 0.5. The 8200 starts registering at 2.8 plus 0.9, it's almost 
up to four and still nothing on the speed light. Get up to half power, we're at 5.6 on the Explorer plus 0.6, the 8200 4.0 plus 04. The speed light just now at half power on the speed light starts to register full power on any of these. The Explorer 600 was over eight, it was over F8, it, it, almost F11, almost it was F8 uh, plus uh, 0.5. The 8200 was uh, leading behind it fairly well at 5.6 plus 05 and the speed light 4.0 plus 0.2. Now you might already start realizing and start seeing that there's just about a stop difference in light. So going from four to 5.6 to eight, that makes a lot of sense. Now, it's only one light in a dark kitchen that's trying to measure 12 feet away. And I've got really dark, uh, old fashioned granite in here. By the way, it's gonna be updated soon. But I've got very uh, dark colors that are making it hard to shed that light. So let's go on with some of the measurements of getting this closer than to the lights themselves. So cutting the distance in half, still doing the same bounces, didn't move the lights. This is how the numbers worked out. Once again, we're at ISO 320, one one hundredth of a second. And now as we're flashing a lot closer, half the distance, when we're at eighth power, the uh, Explorer 600 is showing 5.6 plus 0.6. The uh, 8200 is exactly one stop behind it at 4.0 plus 0.6. But the speed light is uh, then just a little under, a little over, I should say, that uh, one stop difference of 2.8 plus 0.0 now, nine. So taking those forward as we go up to a quarter power, we can see that there's about a stop difference to each. Half power, same way. Full power, the same way. And full power really reveals what's going on here when we take a look at the Explorer 600 is a 16, F16 plus 0.5, and the 8200 is 11, almost at 0.5, and then the speed light trails right behind it at eight. That's almost exactly one stop of power difference. So when we're talking about that kind of division, you might think, well, that doesn't quite make sense because I've got 600 watt seconds here, I've got then uh, 200 watt seconds here, and these aren't really ranked at watt seconds. Speed lights never really are. They say, oh, maybe they're at 60 watt seconds. Well, that's just the, the amount of wattage per second you know, that's uh, derived. It's not the measure of how much light, plus certain things are lost. So the Explore 600, I always keep the diffuser on top of it, and uh, that's just really to protect the ball. Right? It's not necessarily to diffuse the light, it's already being diffused off the ceiling. I could maybe get more power out if I did that, but I could do the same thing with the Evolve. The Evolve 200 or the 8200 uh, Godox has the Fresnel head on it, the speed light head. I could go bare bulb, there's also other modifiers. But if you're going to go to that extent and you have to put a modifier on to, uh, to protect your bulb, it's not really a portable, so much a portable item any longer, you just might as well go big or go home and just get the Explorer 600. So, kind of this is once again, though, uh, an Apple apples apples comparison of how much power would be used. Once again, it's really only about a stop difference when we have this much power. Um, so if you do though want a lot of power, once again, the Explorer 600 would be the way to go, but the 8200 isn't that far really behind it. The, the least of course is the speed light now would be uh, to be expected. But some people say that uh, and you'll hear in other reviews like, oh, the Evolve 200, 8200, that's like using four speed lights or somebody will say that, well, not really. It's really more like using about two, and then this would be like using four speed lights on this. So it does help. But how do these compare with some of the other features that they have? Let's take a closer look at that. We'll get into that next. So flash power is just one part of the equation when it comes into gear buying decisions. It's very important, obviously, as we can see, there's really just about one stop of light difference using the standard ceiling bounce between a uh, speed light and the Evolve 200 or 8200, and also one stop of difference then between this guy and the Explorer 600. So you can get a lot more light. You can get a fair amount of light. It's like a mama bear, baby bear, and papa bear. But it also is a matter of how much your budget you want to spend on something like this, and also the amount of weight. So let's talk about weight first. I'll talk about some of the, uh, the issues with price and then also some of the other features just very quickly. It's hard to cover it all just in one video, but I'll try to cover some of these more salient points, and hopefully this uh, will help you in some of the gear buying decisions. So with the Explorer, 600, this guy is a beast. So I love the idea that it has this handle on it and I can just carry this guy around. So as I need to, I can pop, pop, pop where I need to. It goes on a stand and like you saw for the ceiling bounce, but it's on the stand. 
You can see it's a bit of a beast. This guy collapses all the way down goes out this way then for a handle. Now, it's extremely sturdy. It's extreme, I've dropped this thing before. I've bumped it up against all kinds of things. I have two of them actually, because I've gone from using Einstein's to also using this for portrait photography. Um, so it has done a very good job for that. It's been very consistent for color, I will say. But for the weight of this guy, I'm looking down here at my notes, by the way, it's uh, seven pounds. So this isn't just out of the spec. This is me weighing it. I got my scale out and I did the scientific method and I did it three times and made sure turning the scale on and off three times that I got the right uh, the weight. Anyways, seven pounds on this guy here. Another feature that I really love about it is that the display is on the side, something I'll get to in just a minute with some of the other ones. So when we get down then to the weight of this guy, it is going to be heavier than a speed light. In fact, it comes in at 2.5 pounds compared to a speed light, which is just barely one pound. Now this is with all the batteries loaded. One of the things you'll find is that specs they'll put online for lights like this, they'll leave it out without the head and without the battery, and they'll show, oh, it's only 20 ounces. Well, yeah, but that's without the heaviest components that are in it. So weighing it yourself, it's about 2.5 pounds. So a lot of times with a speed light, these little guys you've seen me before, I'll have one uh, clipped onto my belt using a monkey clip spider monkey clip and uh, doing that less than even just barely one pound it goes on no problem yeah, I have to tighten my belt a little bit it will start sagging your pants I've seen people put this into a holster I wouldn't feel comfortable putting this onto a, a spider monkey clip clipping it onto my belt and it would be a lot of weight flopping around so I'd have to possibly have some type of special holster I've seen people take out and by the way this is just a, a light stand thing that goes into the back of it and that's just for what I had mounted there but other people will replace this with a handle and then you have something that actually looks like a weapon I don't really care to have something also in this day and age looking like that as I'm out on site with a bunch of strangers and depending on the neighborhood that I'm in but if you do and you're comfortable with that once again you're adding even more weight to it and then you've got that off your uh, off your belt but it is very lightweight compared to this now uh, I don't go to the gym any longer I just use the Explorer 600 as I tell a lot of my clients because they see me carrying this bad boy around and it is it's a it's a bit of a beast but it has a lot of power and most of the time probably about 80% of the shoot it remains on the stand when I do bedrooms and bathrooms I'm just using the speed light that's on my belt that's it this guy is for the main living areas except when I'm in the really large master uh, uh, bedrooms typically then I take it off the stand have it here this guy's got a foot on it all the time that don't have it on here for the test but clipped to my belt so I could put him perhaps in the bathroom and by the way I'll have more information on some of these various lighting techniques with other diagrams that's a, a project that's coming up down the road. So anyways, that's how it works for weight and also some of the portability. Once again, there's very little difference for me from having the 8200 and the Explorer 600 for what I do because this guy stays on a stand most of the time and this guy just doesn't seem portable enough to hang off my belt. I know a lot of people are more comfortable with that and that's fine. Um, so just not my cup of tea. Talking about price, the most expensive of all this is the Explorer 600 coming at about $550 for the non-TTL version. Now as I talk about throughout the books and other videos, you don't need TTL for real estate photography. In fact, it'll work against you big time. You want consistency between all the various frames that you're flashing and compositing. You want to be in control of that and you don't need a, a, a light meter to do that either. It's you using that histogram method that I talk about in videos and throughout the books. So this though at 550, pretty good deal for as long as this guy has lasted forever for me. I've had this particular one here for probably I'd say close to about three years and still going strong, hardly a scratch on him even despite all the dings and bangs that I've put it up against. And I even have another one that I keep as a backup and of course I use that for in my portrait setup. So moving on then to the price though for this. So 550 here on the Explorer 600, we get into the Evolve 200. They don't come down in price because they are so popular, so they run about $300. So you could say it's just about half the price, not quite half the price, maybe about 60% the price, whatever, of an Explorer 600. So it could save you some money. You could get two of these for $600 compared to just one of these for $550. You could distribute your light more evenly because you've got, once again, just two lights. They're about one stop uh, away from using the big boy here on the Explorer 600. So two of these should then give you the same 
amount of light that you would get out of here and you could distribute it very well which is of course something I do throughout the compositing. When you get into the speed lights though this stuff is real cheap. I do not recommend buying these OEM speed lights. I have people will write me all the time they say I've got uh, some Nikon speed lights I've got some uh, Canon speed lights and of course you want to reuse them because you've invested $300 a pop for speed lights but these guys, this happens to be the Flashpoint Zoom R2. It doesn't have the, um, the built-in lithium ion. It still takes the regular AA batteries, and this guy runs just 65 bucks. So being about two stops of power away from here, I'd need four of these guys for here. Well, I could buy four of these guys for 240 bucks, still half the price of this. It's about two of these guys to match this. Once again, doing the ceiling bounce, that's 130 bucks of investment compared to 300 dollars of an investment here. So lastly, just in this video, I wanted to talk a little bit too about some of the usability and portability. I touched on that a little bit throughout this video, but if you're still listening and watching this video, thank you very much, by the way. Um, I'll just finish this off real quick. So I love the idea of having this guy when he's done a bounce, and of course the, the, the light stand's holding this guy um, in its light stand position, as you saw there. Would be He's a beast. When he's like this, I've got all the controls on the side. So a lot of times I work in manual mode. I hate flipping around with this thing. I'm not favorite of it. Also because I'm not brand uh, dedicated. So I'm brand agnostic in case I want to use a Yangnu or some other light. I don't want to just have to be dedicated to, uh, to one commander most of the time. So anyways, this is very portable. I love the idea of it. That's one reason why he stays on a stand because I can also see in real big letters, which helps this old guy in his trifocals to see what's going on on for the amount of power. The speed light, I'll jump over there because that's another simple one. The, the display is always on the back. So no matter whatever you do with the speed light, it's just like the Explorer 600. You see it on the side. In fact, the speed light is probably the most portable and easy to use because the letters and everything is just as you would hold it. When you have this on a stand and it's up like this, yeah, everything is, is going vertical. That's uh, whatever, but it's still big enough to see. It's not that hard to interpret. So that works really well. The one that's least usable when it comes to then the display is the 8200, the Evolve 200, because it's a little tiny thing on the back. And it's okay, I mean, it works really well. I've heard a lot of people say because it is unprotected and you know, you're know you used to setting stuff down, you have to be careful how you set this guy down. Don't set it down on the display, you'll crack it. Another thing too, I've gotten a lot of uh, bad reviews on this is about after a year or so, the on off switch, which is here on the side, tends to just fail. It just tends to break, it is kind of a cheap little plastic thing um, that has to, it's actually mechanical going back and forth compared to uh, these which are more of a, a mechanical toggle which uh, has little spring-loaded uh, contact in it to have it go on or off. So that's a, this has also a mechanical switch, but at the price, these things are just disposable. 65 bucks stops working. I'd throw it out and buy another one and have, a, have another one come in. So that's kind of how I see it. I still don't think this is a bad light, the Evolve 200. I can give a full review on it if you'd like. Just leave a comment for it and I'll actually put it to the test more, trying to use this entirely on a shoot or at least a good portion of it. But I find that I go very fast. I've just for years also just been used to using the Explorer 600, but that's a bias also that I have because I've been so used to using this. So is there a right way, a wrong way to go about this? Not really. Once again, just to recap, the amount of light that you're really going to get out of this when you're using the most common type of ceiling bounce is about one stop of difference. So you got about one stop of difference between a speed light and the Evolve 200, and there's about another stop of difference between the Evolve and the Explorer 600. You can get a lot out of here. I've been in huge places. I need to go full power. It's been very, very rare. I don't use a ceiling bounce. I use a white reflector bounce. Comes in very handy for that. Weight wise, this guy is a beast. And so if uh, you're, you're small framed, if you're not uh, able to carry around uh, heavy gear, this guy may be out. Keep it on standby possibly for some of the bigger shoots, but just don't take it on every shoot. You just might not need it. And if you're on a budget and you need to really watch what you're doing, this might not be the guy for your choice right off the bat. This guy might not be either because you can do a lot with the speed lights. Once again, four speed lights equals this guy. Two speed lights equals that guy. No matter what they might say on other reviews, you can test this yourself. If you have an Evolve 200 or you want to buy one, you're thinking about it, you can run the same test I did just with a light meter and in the room using a ceiling bounce. So price-wise though, about 65 bucks, about 300 bucks, about 550 bucks. If you do enough shoots, this stuff pays for itself. The camera costs way more and so do the lenses. You knew that because you're a real estate photographer and you've made that investment.
Anyways, I hope this tutorial, this video is useful for you and that you can use some of this throughout your photography as well. If you did like this video, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It won't cost anything. And as soon as one of these videos is posted, you'll be the first to know. Thanks a lot for watching. Until next time, take care, be safe, and get out there and shoot something.